So good morning, brothers and sisters. How are you? Good morning. I'm glad to see you. I can see uh, Andiso, Dikan, Cyprian, and see Tabitha. I see all of you and faces that I've not seen in a long time. May God bless us all as we fellowship. Um, I'd like to straight away get into the presentation. And just to begin, I wanted to apologize. I should have been there in person. I planned to come, but certain things got in between. Kindly accept my apology. I should have been there in person. Thank you. So this morning, uh, we are considering um, faith and doctrine, unity in faith and doctrine. And I'm sure your minds go straight away to how the apostles were united. This morning, Pastor Alan Stam touched briefly on Acts chapter 2. And we see how in Acts chapter 2, the apostles were fully united. Are we desiring to be as united as the apostles? Let me see by a show of hands, how many of us are desiring to be as united as the apostles? Thank you. It is something that we ought to strive for. It is something we ought to work for. And it is something we ought to pray for. It is certainly a very good thing. If you read in Acts chapter 2, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I'll skip uh, to verse 3. It says, and there appeared unto them, cloven tongues like as of fire, and they sat upon each of them. Verse 4 says they were all filled. If you look at those words, you see they were all with one accord. It sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. At these times, I'm sure you remember, we have been praying, and I'm sure you know, even in the GC churches, they're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Many churches, many places, people are looking for the time when this will be fulfilled, that the Lord will send the latter rain. How it behooves us to know that unity is required. Unity is required for this to be fulfilled. Uh, verse uh, 42 of Acts chapter 2 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. I know that um, all around us, if you look, even in politics, people are struggling to unite. People are struggling to work together so that they may achieve more. And much of what we see in the unity today in the world, that is unity for evil. So how much more should the people of God unite for good so that we may achieve much more for the glory of God? Acts chapter 2, 45 says, and sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We have been fighting for evangelism, working so that the people of God may come to his house and have the joy of walking with the Lord. That is evangelism. And the Lord who in the former reign saw what the apostles had done in obedience, endorsed their unity. He endorsed their unity by not only pouring the Spirit of God upon them, but he also added to the church daily, such as should be saved. I believe that we have also considered at some point what the pioneers went through. We know that at the beginning, the pioneers struggled for unity, not only to understand what the scriptures say, but also to work together. And Ellen G. White records for us what they went through in 
testimonies to ministers between the four. Uh, um, paragraph three says, my husband with elders Joseph Bates, Stephen Pierce, Kira Medson, and others who are keen, noble and true, was among those who after the passing of the time in 1844, search for the truth as for hidden treasure. We would come together, burdened in soul, praying that we might be one in faith and doctrine. For we knew that Christ is not divided. At one point at a time was made the subject of investigation. The scriptures were often with a sense of awe. So not only do we find the names of some of these pioneers, but we also find what they were doing. They searched for truth as for hidden treasure. You find that, uh, I think that's an allusion to the parable of the pearl of great price as well. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, I think you can, you can find it there. But you also find that not only were they searching for truth, but they were also praying that indeed they might be one in faith and doctrine, just as a theme of uh, the topic that we are handling today unity in faith and in doctrine because she says they knew that christ is not divided it means that whenever we are not united we are saying to the world that christ is divided i'm sure that's not something that you want to tell the world because it's not true at all christ is not divided christ is united he is one but he's also united with his father we're coming to see that in a little bit and this also tells us something about how they were studying. They were not studying everything at the same time, all things at the same time, no. They took a subject, one point, and made it the subject of investigation. That means that when something comes up, this, like today, we were looking at baptism. You look at baptism in detail and make it the subject of biblical investigation. And when the scriptures are open, they are open with a sense of awe. That means people recognize that this is God speaking to his children. It is not just any man who is speaking, who has written something. No, it is God speaking to his children. So the scriptures are to be open with respect, knowing that this is God speaking to men. I know there are churches where a church where I used to attend and children used to run all over the pulpit, even at, at during the sermon, and it tells us how in some of our churches, people have even forgotten how the scriptures and how the word of God is to be approached. It is with a sense of awe, because this is God speaking to his children. And God rewarded the work of the pioneers. We know that for a while, actually for the last 50 years, the phrase the last 50 years that Ellen White uses a lot, shows how God answered their prayer and he showed them what they needed to know. Look at how she records it. She says, often we, we fasted that we might be better fitted to understand the, the truth. After earnest prayer, earnest prayer, if any point was not understood, it was discussed and each one expressed his opinion freely. Then we would again bow in prayer and honest supplications went up to heaven that God would help us see eye to eye that we might be one as Christ and the Father are one. Many tears were shed. Have you ever shed tears for the gospel? Have you ever shed tears? And look at how she records this. She says it was with earnest prayer. Yesterday, I remember some of the discussions we had I wasn't listening to everything, I couldn't hear very well, but I realized that people express their opinions on church organization. Look at how it happens. I remember Brother Sami commenting that this is how we discuss things in Africa. And uh, the pastor so that it's actually slightly different from how they discuss things. But it, indeed, it's recorded for us also here that people express their opinions freely. And this is not just opinion. You know, we all have opinions, but opinions that are biblical should not be suppressed. We should, have, we should allow brethren to see or to express how they see the matter from the Bible. And she says they express their opinions freely. 
And then they didn't leave it up expressing opinions, no. People bowed again in prayer and earnest supplications went up to heaven. That means they were sincere in even expressing their opinions. They were not just expressing opinions to shut Cyprian down, to tell Tabitha that, no. They were expressing biblical opinion so that God would answer their prayers in earnest supplication they went to God. And the end of it, they were desiring to be as one as Christ is with the Father. And that, when they did that, they shed many tears. I believe even tears of joy when they came to understand the points of differences that are now harmonized in truth. And you realize that as much as the world is struggling for unity, a lot of the unity that we see in the world is false. People come together to go and rob a bank. People come together to win electoral seats by fraud. People come together to do crazy things. I, I say again, how much more should the people of God come together for the great things that God desires, the blessings for his children? And we see that the pioneers came together. Now, what is faith? I know that this is something that we have studied a lot, and I'm just going through something you're familiar with, because you're looking at unity in faith and doctrine. You must be familiar, you must understand what faith is. And Paul records for us in Hebrews 11 that faith is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As much as we look at this, let us remember that as brethren, in these times, our faith should be such that we are united in the things we are looking forward to. There are certain things we are looking forward to, the greatest of which is the beginning of our eternal life. Christ says that already we have crossed from death to life by believing in him. But we are also looking for the fulfillment of that in reality when Christ comes in the clouds. And so faith constitutes a major part of our motivation. And Paul says that for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. There are things that we are hoping for which haven't happened yet. But by believing in them and being so convicted that they are true, we understand that even the things that we didn't know about creation, we believe that the walls were framed by the word of God the word of God, the powerful word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear expressing the power of God. I looked at something in um, the Bible and saw other places where faith is recorded for us. For example, in Hebrews 11, that same chapter, verse 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we truly believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that will work for our unity. We also, we also told by Paul in the book of Romans chapter 5 that we are justified by faith. We must be justified by faith, not by works. We are justified by faith. That unites us as well as brethren when we are justified by faith. And in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we also told for we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's important because in the walk of faith, there are many times when things will not look like they are going right. In our local churches, sometimes you may see you have needs that can't be fulfilled. You have your own personal needs. You, are, you have your own struggles. And if you are to walk by sight, you might say, this is impossible, but we walk by faith. And that unites us. If we are truly walking by faith, then we'll be united with Christ. In Romans 10 also, verses 10 and 11, Paul tells us, the inspired word of God says, with the heart man believeth to righteousness, for the scripture say, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So Paul connects faith and belief. Our faith must be connected with our belief. And there are places where in, in the scriptures, faith and belief are used almost interchangeably, like they mean the same thing. If you have faith, 
you can only have faith in that in which you believe. If you don't believe in something, you can't have faith in it. And if you have faith, you must believe that thing so that it drives you to seek it. So that even in seeking God, as you're told in Hebrews 11, 6, you're told, God, we must believe. He who cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith and belief are kind of the same. There are ways in which you can use them interchangeably. But what is saving faith? I looked at Noah Webster's dictionary, which is the dictionary that was used around the early times. Most of the early writers used this dictionary so that we understand if they use the word faith, we understand the context in which they use it. And I like this definition. If you look at uh, your EGY writings, you will find the fourth definition of faith. I think this one because I think it relates a lot to what we are studying today. Faith is described as evangelical. How I wish they described it as Adventist. You know, they should have said faith is an Adventist principle, isn't it? If we had exercised faith, maybe the dictionary writers one day would write that faith is an Adventist principle. But here they describe it as evangelical. Evangelical justifying or saving faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth of divine revelation on the authority of God's testimony accompanied with the cordial ascent of the will or approbation of the heart or approval of the heart. An entire confidence or trust in God's character and declarations and in the character and doctrines of Christ with an unreserved surrender of the will to his guidance and dependence on his merits for salvation. In other words, that firm belief of God's testimony and of the truth of the gospel, which influences the will and leads to an entire reliance on Christ for salvation. That's a long explanation. But look again, even Noah Webster's dictionary links faith to belief. Have you seen the word belief there? You see the word belief there? A firm belief. And it also talks of ascent of the mind. That means your mind accepts that this is really true. And then it also says it is accompanied by the approval of the heart. Your heart says with, from its depth, your heart says this is true. I believe that this Revelation is divine, it comes from God, it is the testimony of God. And then it is not just belief in anything, it is in the character and the doctrines of Christ. And there is nothing we are holding back. It's an unreserved surrender. We surrender to Christ and say, Christ, lead me, guide me, and I depend on you, not on myself. In other words, I have a firm belief in the testimony of God and the truth of the gospel. And so when this happens, it influences the will and leads to an entire reliance on Christ. How about doctrine? So what is doctrine? Let's open the book of John chapter 7. John chapter 7, let's read the Bible. Brothers, let's read the Bible. I see you have Bibles there with you. Let's open John chapter 7, verses 14 to 17. What does it say? It says, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up, in, up into the temple and taught. Jesus did what? He taught. Verse 15. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man let us, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Sorry, there's a small typo there in verse 17. Some words are missing. Um, that the doctrine of Christ was not his own. That means when you look at verse 14, doctrine, we can understand doctrine as teaching. Christ taught. So that when he speaks in verse 16 about my doctrine, then he says, my teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. So Christ didn't teach his own things. If we teach our own things, then that is our own doctrine. That is something 
that is not true. And Christ himself, if Christ spoke the doctrine, the teaching that he taught was not of his own, but of him that sent him. And we know that that is the Father, isn't it? It is the Father who sent him. So Christ didn't teach his own things. He spoke the words that his Father sent him. Now, um, I have much to say on unity. Unity in faith and doctrine. And I looked up how the pioneers approached it, especially from the inspired writing of Ellen G. White. And I found that she stresses on the need to read three chapters of John. She especially talks about the last chapters of John. John uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17, saying those are the last sermons of Christ. But she especially, on the matter of unity, she stresses that we need to read John chapter 17. In um, uh, the GC Bulletin of April, the uh, General Conference Bulletin of April 23, 1901, she writes this, read the 17th chapter, the 17th chapter of John, and you will see that God has given us the privilege of being united in Christian love. Brethren with brethren, all being bound together by the golden chain of love, which has been let down from heaven to unite the believers. God wants you to be like himself. He wants to keep you unspotted from the world to forgive your sins and to draw you to himself that you may step off the ladder into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The 17th chapter of John. And to be that God has given us the privilege of being united in Christian love. Have you ever considered unity with other brethren as a privilege? It's a privilege indeed. But look at this morning, we were with Pastor Allen's town as he was about to get into a plane to travel back home. He's miles and miles away from us. We were united with Pastor Sims, Pastor Mesa, and other brethren I can see uh, we have our sister Irina Radia uh, united here with us. And uh, the other brethren who may be logging in and others who may even watch these presentations later. It is our privilege indeed to be united with these people far away from us, that in their love for Christ, they may also see our love for Christ. And as Christ draws us near to him, we are drawn near to one another. And God reminds us in his word that he wants to keep us unspotted from the world, to forgive our sins and to draw us to himself, that we may step up the ladder. You remember the ladder that uh, Jacob saw in Genesis 28, climbing round after round, step after, uh, after step, that we may reach the height of the best that God wants to give us, and that's eternal life. We are stepping off the ladder, not so that we stop following him. But having followed him, we have reached the highest rung of the ladder and we step into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And John 17, which we have been reminded to read, is actually a prayer, Christ's prayer for us. And I'm just going to go through John 17 because I'm not sure. When was the last time you read John 17? From verse 1 to the last? I don't know. If it's not been recent, let's read it together. Let's just read it together so that the Lord may impress the need for unity from the words which Christ spoke. John 17 says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the man which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things 
whatsoever thou hast given me out of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and thou hast and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee. That, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also we shall believe on me through their work, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are, we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Um, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, sometimes when we do Bible studies, we tend to put in a lot of our words, but when we read the Bible itself, we hear the words, and from Christ we hear it as those to whom he was speaking directly heard it. Now that is a good Bible study. Just read the words of Christ and let the people hear what Christ was saying to the people. I believe you have seen how it was Christ's desire that we may be one as he is one with whom? With the Father. Amen? We praise God for that because Christ shows us by example that he is one with the Father in obedience and their unity is not so that they are one person. The 17th chapter of John shows us many things. There are a lot of deep truths here in the prayer of Christ for us. And remember Christ is even praying for you and I. But those who will believe the word of God through the speaking, the preaching that the disciples preached, may also be one. Christ is praying that we may be one. He prayed for you. Have you believed that Christ prayed for you? Do you believe that Christ prayed for you? Amen. I thank God that Christ prayed for me as well. And he prayed for us that we may be one. Now, we, Energy White tells us, this is this day with God, a devotional. I believe it's in another source as well. Because devotionals are compilations. But this day with God, page 269, paragraph 3, says, We must present an unbroken font in union and in faith. By the way, these are remarks. Many of these remarks that Ellen D. White makes are based on John 17. Her comments she makes by revelation 
on June 17th. And she says, we must present an unbroken front in union and in faith. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his grace. It is through this union that the enemy comes in and sows his seed. We need the truth on every point. It should we be united just in a few things? No, we should be united on every point, on truth. Remember, John 17, Christ says that sanctify them by, by what? By truth. So unity, if it is not based on truth, is false unity. We have seen that. People in the world unite to do things that are not of God. And unity in falsehood will not be unity, really. It does not lead us anywhere. She goes on to say, we need less of our own words and more of the word of God. We are near the close of time, and we cannot afford to make a mistake. Truth will bear away victory. We must love as the brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And she quotes 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. We must practice Christian politeness. A soft answer to cruel thrusts turns away wrath. By the way, you recall that in the previous presentation, Pastor Allen Stump showed us how, Christ, uh, how Ellen White quotes the words of Christ from the Bible and she puts them in quotes. You see this as an example? You see this as an example where she puts in quotes when she quotes directly from the Bible and uses the very words? Okay, so it tells us where she uses the very words she puts. Uh, them in quotes. But uh, just not to forget the point that to achieve unity, sometimes there are times when we may hear things from the brethren, even in a Bible study, and we disagree. But she says we must practice Christian politeness. Christian politeness, a soft answer to cruel thrusts, turns away wrath. Uh, Solomon also records that in Proverbs, how a soft answer uh, turns away wrath. Now, uh, she again tells us, emphasizes the importance of studying the 17th chapter of John. And she says, it is full of marvel and fatness. Are there not urgent reasons why we should talk with, with these words of Christ? Is it not time we sought for the unity which for which the Savior prayed? Shall we open our hearts to the melting love of Jesus? Shall we let that love take the place of the coldness and hardness that have been revealed in our characters? Have we seen coldness and hardness in our characters? In my character, I pray, may God forgive me if I've shown coldness and hardness of heart. But we should reveal the character of Christ. She says, may the Lord have compassion on us that he may forgive our perversity and heal our backsliding and unite the hearts of all that believe the truth in that oneness for which Christ prayed, that which exists between the Father and the Son. This, um, I'm not sure which book is, uh, this is PRT, uh, January 26, 1893. Now, if you read John 17, according to what she says, the oneness for which Christ is the oneness also that exists between the Father and the Son. If you read this, uh, John 17, clearly, and I know many of us have memorized John 17, 3, uh, as one of the verses that tell us the truth about the unity between the Father and the Son and tell us about the personality of God. But the unity between Christ and and his father is not to make them one being. No, it is the unity of purpose, unity in truth, unity of character. And that is shown in their spirit, is shown in the words that they give us. So Christ and his father are not one being as we had been made to believe in the previous uh, teachings that we had. But then we are also reminded that Coldness and hardness of heart may be some of the things that make our unity very difficult to achieve at these times. 
May God have compassion on us and forgive us because this is perversity and it is backsliding. She also says that sometimes you may have gone into error, into sin by doing something against a brother. What should you do when you realize that you have erred, you have sinned against a brother? This is the first work that we are called to. What does she say? Just as soon as you're impressed that there is something standing between you and God, or between you and your brethren, leave your gift before the altar of prayer and do that which Christ has said you must do in order for the wrong to be taken out of the way. This is the first work that is to be done in this conference. If we expect the blood of Jesus to be efficacious in our behalf, if we confess and forsake our sins, we shall come into that close relation to Jesus to which reference is made in the 17th chapter of John. So we have come to church, we have come to pray, and we realize there's something between us and God, a sin we committed. What should we do? What is the first work? According to this quote, the first work is to leave that prayer at the altar, leave that altar of prayer, and go back and confess that sin so that there's nothing between God and us. Also, if there's something between me and the brother, I should leave that altar of prayer and go and confess my sin and clear the matter with my brother and with a forgiving heart, let the matter be sorted out so that when we come to God, there is nothing between. You remember the song that says, nothing between? Nothing between, between who? My Lord and my Savior, between me and my Lord, who is also my Savior. Let there be nothing between. If there's something that needs to be forgiven, let's confess it. What is this sin that I'm holding so close and so dear to me that I'm letting it be between me and my Savior? Really? That sin, if it is confessed, then the path to righteousness may be open and my prayer will be heard. Even if it is between me and my brother, I should confess that sin. Is there a sin between you and your brother that you need to confess? then let it be confessed, and that will help us achieve greater unity. Now, Christ is one with the Father. This is one of the places where Ellen G. White clarifies the unity between the Father and the Son. Christ is one with the Father, but Christ and God are two distinct personages. They are not one being, even though they are united. They are one. Read the prayer of Christ in the 17th chapter of John and you will find this point clearly brought out. How honestly the Savior prayed that his disciples might be one with him as he is one with the Father. Um, as he is one with the Father. Sorry, just a Read the prayer of Christ in the 17th chapter of John and you will find this point clearly brought out. How honestly the Savior prayed that his disciples might be one with him as he is one with the Father. But the unity that is to exist between Christ and his followers does not destroy the personality of either. Does Christ maintain his personality even though he is one with the Father? Yes, he has his individual personality. And do we retain our personality even when we are one with Christ? Yes, we are individuals. We are still individuals, but we are one with Christ and we are one with the Father. By this unity, sorry, they are to be one with him as he is, with one, is one with the Father. By this unity, they are to make it plain to the world that God sent his Son to save sinners. So our unity is for a purpose. Why did Christ want us to be united? So that we are to make it plain to the world that God sent who? His Son to save sinners. The oneness of Christ's followers with him is to be the great unmistakable proof that God indeed did indeed send his Son into the world to save sinners. But a loose, lax religion leaves the world bewildered and confused. Do you see how our uni this unity messes up our evangelism? Because we are told when you are not united, what happens? When you have a lax, loose religion, 
it leaves the world bewildered and confused. They begin to wonder, really? This is what Christ called these people to look at how they're disunited. Look at how they're fighting against one another. Look at how they're gossiping about one another. Look at how they're undercutting one another. Look at how they're competing against one another. So the world is left bewildered and confused when God's people are not united. And indeed, when you're not united, it actually shows we are fighting against Christ's own prayer. Christ has prayed that we, are, we be united as is one with who? With the Father. But when we fight against one another, we are not only fighting against each other, but we are fighting against the prayer of Christ. His deep desire that we should be united. How I pray that we may be united, that the world may see that indeed God sent his son. He loved us so much. He didn't want us to be lost in sin. He sent his son to save me, a sinner. When we are united with one another, that is a summon in itself to the world. Amen. And we see, now we might want to begin asking, among us, among us, those who have believed in the truth of the Father and the Son. We have believed the truth. I know we have believed the truth. Look at the Bible. And you see how God loves us so deeply that he sent his son. And you have come to appreciate that truth. You have read it, you have studied it, and you have believed it. And another brother, all of us here in the hall, all of us listening, I believe we have believed the truth of the Father and the Son. So we might ask ourselves, what is lacking? What is lacking there? How come we have the same faith? We have the same doctrine or teachings? I believe we have the same teaching. So what is lacking? Maybe, let's ask ourselves, what is it that is lacking between us that our disunity is bewildering and confusing the world? What is lacking? I just mentioned, I put down some of the things that I think are lacking, but the things that hinder our unity among those who have come to believe the truth of the Bible. One of them is lack of faith. Indeed, I believe that is what was in the mind of those who came up with this symposium to come up with the topic of unity in faith and doctrine. I believe they realize that there is lack of faith. That is why there is lack of unity. So lack of faith is one of the reasons why we are not united. Another thing is strange doctrines or lack of truth. Strange doctrines is just one way of saying lack of truth. When we have strange doctrines coming among us, we have believed that indeed Christ is present in our hearts by his word. And somebody comes and says, well, Christ lives in us literally. And they believe it and they teach it. Do you realize how that will cause disunity? You see that? We see how strange teachings or lack of truth may lead to lack of unity. Actually, it leaves the world bewildered. It leaves the world confused. It leaves the world wondering whether these are truly the ones following Christ. Because Christ is not divided. Christ is one with the Father. And he has only one truth. Christ has, doesn't have many truths. Yes, I believe there are many truths. But the saving truth is one. The gospel is one truth. And it is not relative. So that we say it was true in the times of Ellen D. White. And it is not true today. Or it was true in the time of the apostles. But it's not true today. No. The truth of God is one. And his truth is that he sent his, his son into the world that they who believe in him might have eternal life. In, uh, 3.16. So strange doctrines or lack of truth may cause disunity. When one believes something different from the brethren and they go and teach it, it causes disunity. Another cause of disunity is a lack of practical Christianity. We saw in Acts chapter 2 how the apostles were united in faith and in doctrine. And that was practical Christianity. In fact, later we see that they were even concerned 
about widows among them, even widows who are not of uh, Jewish origin. And we see they were concerned about their welfare. They were united in truth. And Acts chapter 2 shows us how people live and sold their possessions and all they had was shared in common. That is an example of practical Christianity. Is there practical Christianity in your local church? Is there local, sorry, is there practical Christianity in your local uh, group of brethren who you meet with, such that when somebody lacks something, we all work together to unite, to help them meet that lack? Is it in our hearts to see that brethren are not suffering among us? Remember that Paul, in gathering the offerings of the brethren, he saw the suffering of the brethren in Jerusalem, and he went round the churches collecting offerings that he might supply the want of those who had something of need. That is practical Christianity. And if it was there in the time of the apostles, we need it even more now. I, I know that among us, there are many who have lost their jobs. There are many who have lost their livelihoods. This time or this past year has been very tough. Have we just been seeing what the brethren are going through and all we say is, oh, that is so sad. That is so sad. We will pray for you. Yes, it's good to pray. It is good to have pity when we are saying, oh, that is so sad. That is, we are moved to pity. Yet, we must have practical Christianity. That is what James calls us to. We can't just call the brethren and say, I pray for you, be warm. And you do nothing about it when God has put it in your power to do something. Practical Christianity has been exemplified to us by the apostles, apostles in Acts chapter 2. And practical Christianity is one of the things that will make us to be united. The other is a lack of holy zeal. People do strange things. People endure nights sitting to watch movies, to watch football, to watch funny things. They have zeal for the things of the world. And yet the people of God have no zeal, no zeal for the righteousness of Christ, for the work of the gospel. Have we zeal for the gospel? I believe that our lack of zeal is one of the things that drives us to this unity. And lastly, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. There may be other things, but these are the ones that came to my mind as I was studying this. Unwillingness to be worked by the Spirit of God. Selfishness. I have changed something about myself so much that I don't want to let it go. And even when the Spirit of God is convicting me, this is wrong. This is wrong. Surrender self to Christ, and I hold on to it. That is one of the things, the factors, the things that cause disunity in the church. Now, uh, as I'm heading to finishing, um, looking at how the world is seeing us especially, remember that some of us were removed from our churches for believing the truth about God. And having now studied the truth about God, we have, God has brought us together as brothers in truth, brothers and sisters. He has called us into truth. And those, some of you who are chased away from your churches, those who you left behind, and you told them, I have left with a good heart. Even if I've been chased away, I've left with a good heart. But now they're following you. They're watching you. They're seeing all of you are banded together. They're seeing all of you are now worshiping in certain churches, in certain places. They are watching. They are watching to see what is that truth doing in you? What, what has it done? What has God wrought? And some of them may say, even with jeering, mockingly, say, look, they left us saying they have truth. Now I'll see, what are they doing? Some people are mocking. The world is watching. What does Ellen G. White say? Review on Herald, September 6, 1881, she says in paragraph 9, that church whose members feel that they are not responsible for its prosperity will fail to show to the world the unity, love, and harmony that exist with the true children of God. Worldlings are constantly watching and criticizing with keenness and severity those who profess to love and serve God, yet who show by their lives 
that they are strangers to the influence of divine grace. Ah. When we are disunited, we are saying divine grace, we don't even, we have never had it. We have never even accepted it. That's what we're saying to the world. We are watching. When we are disunited, when we are fighting amongst ourselves, we are actually telling the world that divine grace has not touched us. And listen to this. This I found this so interesting. It is too bad, says the unbeliever, to spoil a good worldling to make a bad Christian. Did you hear that? It is too bad, says the unbeliever, to spoil a good worldling and make a bad Christian. That man is as sharp and eager to advance his own interests as before he professed religion. And what an unchristian spirit he manifests, how he loves to exalt himself, how unkindly he speaks of others. He sees something to find fault with every man's character. I tell you, although he belongs to the church, that man will need watching. The unbelievers are saying, maybe let me use the example of Dan. When Dan was in the world, he was a good man. But now after being converted and he now calls himself a Christian, he is not, not a good worldling anymore. He is now a bad Christian. He is sharp and eager to advance. He's so selfish. His own interests, he puts them even before his professed religion. And he has such an unchristian spirit. He loves to exalt himself. He speaks of others unkindly and he finds fault with everyone. Wow. The world is saying that man should have been left in the world. He was better when he was in the world. He was a better worldly. You should have left him there. If I brought somebody from the world and he was better in charity, he was kind, he, was, he listened to the needy, he gave an ear to them. But when he came to the church, he wasn't giving time. He was fighting the, the elders, the pastors. He was speaking ill of others. He was fighting the very gospel he stood, he stood for. Surely, maybe he should have been left in the world. This, the world is watching. Maybe it would have been better to leave people in the world if we had to bring them to find a disunited church. You remember the quote in last day events that God is now not working to bring many into the faith because of the many unconverted souls that are in the church. Remember that quote? If the people of the world come to find a healing down in Christ and they find us fighting and disunited, they could have been better in the world. Because when they were in the world, they knew there was a problem. They were seeking unity, they were seeking truth, they were seeking healing. But when they come to the hospital, the place where they should find healing and find people are worse than in the world, maybe the Christian the unbelievers, the unbelievers in the world say, let the good worldling remain in the world. What a, what a summer. The world is teaching us. Is the world teaching us or not? They're teaching us. Those who have proclaimed, this is the call which was been given in the book GRC 38, uh, paragraph 3. This is our call. Last, this is as I had to finish. We need to press together. Those who are proclaimed the Seventh-day Adventist Church as Babylon, and that is a whole topic on its own. She, she talks about those who call the church Babylon. And remember, which church is this she's speaking about? The true church or the false church that calls itself the Seventh-day Adventist Church? There's a true church, and there's also another church that calls itself the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you may see more of that in... Uh, test, uh, in uh, um, so which book is this? Um, 1SM 204. 1SM 204, you may get to know there that there's a true church and a church that she was seeing emerging, the new organization. And she says, those who call the true church Babylon have made use of the testimonies in giving their position as a, as a seeming support. But that's not our topic today. Look at this. She says, but why is it that they did not present that which for years has been the burden of my message, the unity of the church. Why did they not quote the words of the angel? Press together, press together, press together. Why did they not repeat the admonition and state the principle 
that in union there is strength, in division there is weakness. This has been the message of LNGY all along. Press together, press together, press together. Brethren, I repeat these words. Let us press together. Amen? Let us do what? Press together. Let us press together. And remember, in union there is strength, in division there is weakness. The Lord reminds us in June 15, from verse 1, about the true vine and the branches that we ought to bear much fruit. And she tells us in 19 MR that we must work on the plan of addition and the plan of multiplication. He says the only safety for the Christian is to be unwearied in his efforts to live on the plan of addition. The apostle shows the advantages to be gained in that school. For those who add grace to grace, God will work on the plan of multiplication so that the graces will be in and abound in the religious life and they will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those abounding in the Christian graces will be zealous, lively, vigorous in all practical Christianity and will practice righteousness. Just as the branch abiding in the vine will produce the same fruit that the vine bears and will bring forth much fruit. Christ in John 15 calls us to be united to him as the true vine. And we cannot claim to be bearing much fruit when we are disunited. Christ seeks for us to bear the fruit of unity to show that indeed the Father sent him to the world. He who loved us sent his son to the world. We cannot claim to be working for Christ when we are bearing another fruit. Isaiah talks of wild, wild grapes. The Lord planted the vineyard and he worked on it and the, the vine grew and yet it gave wild oats, no, wild grapes. We ought to give the same fruits that the vine gives. We cannot claim to be the branches of Christ when we are working in this unity, when we are working in the things of this world, no. We must produce the same fruit that the vine bears. Practical Christianity we must have or we cannot enter heaven. Hearing and preaching the gospel is not enough. Brothers and sisters, it is not enough to proclaim that we now believe the truth of the Father and the Son. Hearing and preaching the gospel is not enough. We must wear the yoke of Christ. We must learn of him to be new and lowly. We must be doers of the world. If you know this thing, Christ declares. Happy are ye if you do that. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. John 13, verse 17 and James 1, 22. That in, the, in letter uh, 169, written in 1904. Practical Christianity means laboring together with God every day. Every day. There is no day you can say that now I've had enough. No, we must work together. Practical Christianity means laboring together with God every day. Working for Christ, not now and then, but continuously. And neglect to reveal practical righteousness in our lives is a denial of our faith and of the power of God. God is seeking for a sanctified people, a people set apart for his service, a people who will heed and accept the invitation, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, you might never know the day you are preaching, and we are preaching everywhere by our lives, aren't we? The day we will be careless in one little thing. Maybe the day that the Lord presented somebody to hear the word, to see practical Christianity. And so practical Christianity must be an everyday lifestyle we might, we might, that we might show every day, working continuously, letting Christ work in our hearts. Not now and then, not occasionally, not the day when I'm going to preach on the pulpit, not on the day I'm going to baptism, no. Every day. Paul says, I die daily. And Christ tells us, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. I'm reminded of this uh, principle that cows are yoked together. Usually, the younger one that is learning is yoked to the more experienced one so that he learns from the experienced one. The yoke of Christ is not to be a burden. It is so that we may learn of who? Of Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, we must love the brethren. We are to love our brethren as Christ has loved us. We are to be patient and kind. 
Yet there is something lacking we must love. Christ tells us that we must forgive the erring, even, even 70 times 7. How in, infinitely greater is the love of God than is our love. It is not the greatness of our sin, but the depth of our repentance that brings the pardoning love of God to our hearts. When there is much forgiven, the heart loves not. Love is a tender plant. It needs to be constantly cultured, cultivated, or it will wither and die. Is there somebody you need to forgive among the brethren? Is there somebody who needs to forgive you? Maybe there's somebody you need to forgive. Maybe there's somebody who needs to forgive you so that unity may be found. And actually, we are told in this quote we see that what brings the pardoning love of God is not the depth of our sin, but the what? The depth of our repentance. We need to repent, brethren. We have been disunited. We have worked against one another. We have worked and cut, competed against one another. It is the depth of our repentance that will bring the pardoning love of God to our hearts and will truly unite us. And we must cultivate this tender plant called love constantly. Otherwise, it will wither and die. Let us love the brethren that we may be one with Christ. Uh, we are to be one with him even if we are scattered all over the world. Our unity, our zeal will show that indeed Christ is the one sent by his Father. That will take us to the elevated platform of walking with Christ. The, the heart of the Savior is set upon his followers fulfilling God's purpose in all its height and depth. We are to be one with him even though we are scattered the world over. Is this a true picture? This, is this a true picture that we see in our lives? Just ask yourself as I read this quote. There is another who is harsh and severe with those whom he employs. He is impatient even to the animals under his control and abuses them as if they had no fear. Such men have no change for the better. In too many cases, this is a true picture. Have you seen this picture in any of the places where you have been, in the places we worship? People who are severe and harsh? Have I been harsh? Maybe I've been harsh. Maybe I've been so severe. Is this a true picture of my life? What a barrier to have such professed Christians erected. Professed Christian, Christians erected to hinder sinners from coming to Christ. When there are such Christians, we hinder people from coming to Christ. They are a curse to their families and a curse to the church. When we are not united, when we are harsh, when we are severe, when we are doing these things, if this is our true picture, we end up being a curse to our families and a curse to the church. Christ's true disciples will manifest his meekness and gentleness in strong contrast to the storm and bluster and bravado of the great adversary and his followers. May that not be our true picture. In the church. The true picture should be that we should remove these things that hinder our unity. What does the church need today? The church needs in these days, what the church needs in these days of peril is an army of workers who, like Paul, have educated themselves for usefulness, who have a deep experience in the things of God, and who are filled with earnestness and zeal. Sanctified, self-sacrificing men are needed, who will not shun trial and responsibility. Men who are brave and true. This reminds me of the quote in education. Uh, the men who will stand true as the needle is to the core. Men who are brave and true, men in whose hearts Christ is from the hope of glory and who with lips touched with holy fire will preach the word. For want of such workers, the cause of God languishes and fatal errors like deadly poison taint the morals and blight the hopes of a large part of the human race. We are nearing the end of the earth's history, and God calls upon all to lift the standard bearing the inscription. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's in Revelation 14. He calls upon his people to work in perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. He calls upon those engaged in our medical work to unite with the ministry, and all of us are medical workers, medical missionaries. He calls upon 
those engaged in our medical work to unite with the ministry it calls upon the ministry to cooperate with the medical missionary workers and it calls upon the church to take up their appointed duty holding up the standard of true reform in their own territory leaving the trained and experienced workers to press into the new fields if the church if the ministers are fighting against medical missionaries medical missionaries are fighting against uh, those working in the ministry ministering the work that will hinder the gospel but each is to do their duty and support the other so that those who are trained will press on to new fields we will not gain new fields if you are fighting against this part that part the body cannot the hand cannot be working against the foot the foot against the head that body of christ will not will not succeed we will not be we will not find time to press into new fields if we are too busy too busy criticizing fighting one another the way we will gain new fields and we need new fields at this time of the earth's history no word is to be spoken to discourage any for this grieves the heart of christ and greatly displeases and greatly pleases the adversary all need to be baptized with the holy spirit all should refrain from censuring and discouraging remarks and draw near to christ that they may appreciate the heavy responsibilities which the co-workers with him are carrying again the message is to us press together press together are the words of our divine instructor unity is strength disunity disunion is weakness and defeat lastly this is my last slide my last night this is our activity even here in the hall wherever we are let's do this activity discuss with your elder or fellow church worker three things just three things that may hinder unity in your local church think about three things that may be hindering unity in your local church next suggest biblical ways of overcoming them how do you overcome these problems i'm just talking about three problems there may be more but just three, three things discuss just three things with your elder that are hindering your elder or fellow church worker that you are with that may be hindering unity in your local church so just biblical ways of overcoming them consider what you you as an individual can do to make unity a reality what me what i can do to make unity a reality pray next pray that god may help you that god may help me fulfill my responsibility and lastly pray for unity in the scattered church in the whole world may god help us may god bless us that we may press together Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that in your work you have shown us today how beautiful it is for brethren to work together. How urgent is the need for unity. Oh Lord, we pray that you make the this where we have been harsh, where we have been kind, where we have been careless unto one another, unto the brethren in the faith. You have today reminded us of the need for unity, for it will show the world how much you love us, that you sent your son to die for us and by your spiritual calling us to walk in newness of life. We pray, O Lord, that among the churches where there has been disunity, may you unite us, the Lord we may, truly work together in your kingdom and demonstrate to the world how Christ is united with you as a father. You are one. You are united in purpose in everything that you do. Oh Lord, how we pray that we may be the answer to Christ's prayer, that we may truly be one as he prayed for us in that deep prayer of John 17. Help us, O Lord, that in this short time that we have may we not fulfill the prophecy that 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 is in last day events that that which the church has failed to do in times of peace it will have to do in times of great difficulty we have a little time of peace help us to do that we need to do in this little time of peace because the time of trouble is soon upon us 
when these things cannot be done anymore. Bless us with unity, with prayer, with you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.